hello my gentle and of course very modern apes. On this channel, we do things like discuss science and human evolution and primatology and things of that nature, amongst other sillier, goofier things. When I'm debunking pseudoscience, I try to keep topics to pressing matters, actual arguments, and things that I feel are generally worth both my time and yours. But I'm feeling a little bit whimsical today, and I saw that Answers in Genesis on their website, on their channel, posted... Let me just show you. Their new video, which was posted one day ago, is titled, Scientists Grow Extinct Animal Meat? Is this wrong? And the thumbnail is... <laughs> The thumbnail, clearly the topic is on the recent mammoth meatball, which I'll fill you in on in a second, but they've got like a mammoth on one side and on the other side, this hideous steaming meatball on a plate with the <laughs> unbelievably ominous caption, Christians beware with an arrow pointing directly at the meatball. There's just so much about this that needs to be unpacked. First of all, like the title, Scientists Grow Extinct Animal Meat, Is This Wrong? What about this is wrong? Like, what about this is threatening to answers in Genesis to the degree that they felt the need to make a video on it? Um, specifically, this is a, a threat, this is a looming danger, evidently, for Christians, since it says Christians beware. Not, not people in general, but Christians Specifically, this meatball is some kind of domestic threat to the modern Christian way of life. How that works, I'm not quite sure. I think the, the thumbnail is actually quite well made. Answers in Genesis better be paying their thumbnail guy or gal uh, an obscene amount of money because single-handedly, their thumbnail person seems to have like turned around the view count on Answers in Genesis. They didn't used to get quite as many views, um, but lately they've been doing much better. And I think it's due to the clickbait titles. So I'm gonna pop over to videos here so you can kind of see what I mean. Uh, never happened as we look at the Tower of Babel. Christians, please watch. As the title says, this huge issue in schools keeps getting worse. Deeply twisted why critical race theory is way worse than you think. Christians beware, there it is again. It, but you know, in this case, at least AI and this, you know, iRobot looking MF over here is like menacing. The meatball is not. We have <laughs> stopped getting this wrong with the, the cross in the background. This is so wrong with a circle around like a crab's ass. <laughs> this may surprise you with the dinosaur in the background. Christians, please stop doing this, blah, 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 blah. So much different um, propaganda coming out of Answers in Genesis. And when I say propaganda, I, surprisingly, I'm not even talking about the content. I'm talking about the lie that they're selling you with these very appealing, very interesting uh, thumbnails. And then when you hover over it, it's always just like a couple of guys sitting around, like <laughs> talking. It's, it's, not actually, um, it's not actually exciting. Of course I say that and like you clicked on this video and I'm just a, a woman sitting around talking, so I, I guess maybe that one's on me. And you know, like, I'll say admittedly, I'm kind of interested in some of these. I want to know what I, as an evolutionist, will hate about this video with <laughs> giant ground sloth in it. Um, I believe that's the NHM display as well. Uh, this confirms the Bible. I'm interested in that. What, <laughs> what in this 39-minute video will I hate? Um, other than all 39 minutes and 41 seconds. This one is interesting to me as well. When people instantly regret their sin, and it's a woman who looks like she's at like a stand-up show, uh, says she mocks Jesus, and then this happens, and then she's like eating shit, she's like falling over. And you know, I, I always find this to be an interesting take that like God will get offended and then like step in and, and smite someone or like mess with them, as in this case, because it's like, you know, it, there's like genocidal maniacs running around on the planet. Like, you know, where was this? Where was God's pettiness when Pol Pot was doing, you know, the Cambodian genocide? I'm just, I'm wondering if perhaps there's a better use of time, maybe some time management issues going on here. And then, of course, you know, it's, it's rarely exactly what you think it is. Sometimes it is. Like, I'm pretty sure this is what's about abortion, uh, especially given it says pro-choice activists do not want you to know this. But in this one, it says this huge issue in schools keeps getting worse. And it says, Christians, please watch. And like, I can guarantee you it's not about school shootings. And I would propose that as one of the, one of the primary issues in schools right now. 
Anyways, the long and short of his answers in Genesis decide to make a video about the mammoth meatball. So what is the mammoth meatball? Some scientists who work in like meat culturing labs decided it would be a fun experiment to see if they could culture mammoth cells to the degree that we could create like an actual meatball that would be perhaps edible. And so they did that and it was viral on Twitter. It was like, oh my God, they made a, a, a literal meatball out of mammoth cells, right? It's like, it's mammoth meat, even though mammoths are extinct. And that, that was the cool punchline. And then evidently the scientists didn't want to eat it because it was like, well, we don't necessarily know how that's going to interact with the modern human gastrointestinal system or something along those lines. Honestly, I really just read the headline and I was like, oh, that's, that's kind of cool. Sure, whatever. Clearly answers in Genesis felt a bit differently since they decided to, to make a video um, for their answers news segment about the, <laughs> the threat posed by this mammoth meatball. So I thought it would be fun to watch it and kind of react to it. Our <laughs> mammoth meatballs good with spaghetti. Oh brother, this guy stinks! Welcome to Answers News for Monday, April 3rd, 2023. I mean, I know it's meant to be for all audiences, so they've got to use like the lame grandma and grandpa jokes, but I feel like they could have done better. It, I would have loved to see like a meat wad impression from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Our mammoth meatballs good with spaghetti. Hello, I'm Avery Foley, and I'm here with Patricia Engler and Jessica Jaworski, Hello. and we're going to be discussing scientists' creation of a mammoth meatball, in addition to some other stories. So let's get started with scientists grow mammoth flesh in a lab. Mmm, appetizing. No. Um, to make a prehistoric meatball, but they're too afraid to eat it in case ancient protein proves deadly. If you're watching this right now, go down to the comments section and let me know what you think think they're gonna take issue with here. What is it about the mammoth meatballs that is so heretical and blasphemous and bad? Give me your thoughts because I bet you're not gonna be able to guess. For the record, my prediction was that it was going to be an issue with stem cells. They weren't going to like that stem cells were utilized. I think it was like sheep stem cells. And so that's the issue they're taking because the slippery slope, they could take it and use do human stem cell stuff, which you know they hate. Um, that's my idea though, so no stealing. Uh, so <laughs> Shouldn't they have thought that through a little bit, maybe before? <laughs> maybe. maybe. Well, originally they wanted to make a dodo meatball, but then they didn't have the DNA for dodo, so they went with mammoths instead. So when it says mammoth meatball, they don't mean mammoth in size. They mean mammoth in, like, literal mammoth. Woolly mammoth. Um, woolly mammoth. Yeah. Uh, so... They, there's companies out there that are, they have an interesting name, cultivated meat companies, which again, super appetizing sounding. So cultivation is also what we do with crops, right? Cultivated crops. This is not like a, a GMO word, which I guess is, is the issue that they're taking with it. Uh, are you figuring, are you getting hints as to the problem they're going to have with the, with the mammoth meatball yet? Are, have you figured it out? And what they're doing is trying to grow meat in a lab, basically, instead of how we traditionally harvest meat from farm animals. What a benign way of putting the factory farming industrial complex. Now, I'm not a vegetarian, I'm not a vegan, I eat meat, but harvesting from farm animals is, is a little bit of a light way of putting how we get our meat, how the meat goes from you know being inside another animal to being on our table. We, we kill animals, other animals on a massive scale in order to feed our, our tastes. I for one would love lab grown meat. I think it's a I think it's a great thing. I hope that it becomes widespread and I hope that it becomes affordable. But in, anyways, anyways, let's let them continue. And so they decided to come up with something a little more unique and they took the DNA sequence from mammal muscle protein and they filled in the gaps with elephant DNA because mammoths and elephants same created kind. You're going to notice this more and more as the video goes on, but they put so many answers in Genesis isms into these news conferences into these little these little panels that they do like at every possible moment where they can shoehorn in and answers in genesis tenant of belief or like buzzword they shove it right in there the created kind thing is is right here uh but you're gonna see more in a second let's talk for a minute just briefly about the created kind so for those of you who might not know young earth creationists believe that six thousand years ago approximately god created sort of archetypes of animals and the reason that they do this that they hold this opinion is because if god created every animal as it is now in its modern biodiversity and in its state of biodiversity through time you can't fit all the animals on Noah's Ark. So what they need is they need for <laughs> hyper evolution to occur. So God creates one original cat and then that cat 
evolves into all of the modern felids that we see today. Of course, they don't call it evolution. They don't like to call it evolution, but that's what a kind is. It's sort of a, an archetype of an animal family. And the family is usually the level that they put it at, except when it is inconvenient for them, which is why humans are completely separate from all other animals. And Ken Ham even tweeted the other day that he thinks that humans should be in their own kingdom, separate from animalia and using the criteria created in the image of God. It was very funny, very silly. But to talk for a moment about, about elephants and mammoths being in the same kind, they kind of hint around that you're looking at a proboscidean kind. That's all of the elephant and elephant-like animals, so gonfaviers and things of that nature. That doesn't work because there is not enough time for these animals after they you know, presumably get off the ark. If Noah takes two elephant kinds, two proboscidean kinds onto the ark, there is not enough time for them to speciate out into all of the animals that we see, all of the proboscideans that we see in the layers that Answers in Genesis would propose were laid down after the flood of Noah, which they suppose, young earth creationists suppose, is responsible for the entirety of the geologic column, up to the extinction of the dinosaurs anyway. Some of them will push the boundary to like the Eocene, but most of them, and Answers in Genesis typically, supposes that the entire geologic column from the Cambrian to the Cretaceous when the dinosaurs went extinct was laid down during Noah's Ark, the Noah's Ark event. Which, if you're new to the channel, that probably sounds kind of crazy to you, but this is business as usual for, for the veterans here. Now, myself and Walker, a friend of the channel who runs the Just a Walking Fish YouTube channel, did a pretty big deep dive into proboscideans, the, the elephants as sort of a group and elephant ancestors from like Eritherium and Baratherium moving forward and how they create um, innumerable problems for young earth creationism. And this is for two primary reasons. One, it depends on how many proboscidean pairs you take on the ark, because if you'll remember from Sunday school, Noah takes two of every kind of animal. So depending on how many kinds of elephant he takes and how many proboscideans existed before Noah's flood, this has great implications for how much biodiversification and evolution needs to happen after Noah's flood to make sense from the young earth creationist perspective of the fossil record of proboscideans from the post-Cretaceous time period all the way to now. Because boy, mammals do a lot of evolving in the Cenozoic, don't they? And then there's also implications depending on how many pairs of proboscideans Noah takes on the ark for how much food they would need. And both of these are completely untenable. And you can see that video as to why. So they filled in the gaps there with elephant DNA, and then they put them into the myoblast stem cells of a sheep and grew it into a mammoth meatball that they now will not eat because they're like, eh, humans haven't really interacted with mammoth proteins in a, a long while, so they don't really know how the, our human immune system will react to it, so they're, they're not going to eat it, but they did make it. Yeah, so that's super interesting. And they said that they picked the mammoth meat because mammoths are a symbol of diversity loss and climate change. So mm -hmm. what do you think yeah. about that, JJ? <laughs> okay, so if you guessed they're mad because it promotes growing meat in a lab instead of killing animals, or it... <laughs> It brings attention to climate change. You were right. If you guessed anything else, you might still be right because they're actually mad about other things as well as, as we'll get into um, here momentarily. But um, yeah, this is vile. I don't know if you heard someone in the background laughing when she said that it's a symbol for, for climate change, for bringing attention to climate change. And you hear this hearty guffaw from some guy in the back of the Answers in Genesis studio here. Uh, that's disgusting. Young Earth creationism is kind of like flat Earth in that on its own it can be somewhat benign, although no one's trying to get flat Earth taught in school, so there's that. But above all else, it also seems to be a gateway conspiracy theory to other sort of science denialism, like saying that, that the climate isn't warming when it so obviously and so clearly is from every metric we currently have available to us. We see the ice shelves collapsing, we see ecosystems systems collapsing. And I have colleagues who are seeing this at their own study sites. We're seeing ecosystems unable to handle the drastic changes in temperature because the temperature has always changed on planet Earth, but it isn't supposed to change this fast. And the other five times that it changed this fast, we saw mass extinctions. Now, I have a lot to say about mass extinctions, and I'm, I'm going to be talking about them a, a little bit more in a, in a video that's coming up. But this is why, this is one of the many reasons why young earth creationism is actively harmful, even outside of just teaching falsehoods and trying to get them taught in schools. It's because it actively promotes other forms of science denialism in a way that is in every way possible, and I cannot emphasize this enough, 
harmful to everyone on the planet. That sucks. But let's let her continue because she has more to say. Well, that, that's kind of rooted in ideology um, that is looking at that the earth should remain untouched by people, basically, is kind of mm -hmm. what that goes to. But because they believe that human activity is causing global warming, such as um, owning livestock. The science of climate change is absolutely not ideological. It is such a brutally data-driven field because we're, we're straight up just looking at how has the climate changed over time? How have temperatures fluctuated in areas around the world? How has it impacted ecosystem stability? How has it impacted ocean acidification and reef health? This is just very, very quantitative stuff. So the, the idea that it's ideological is silly in and of itself. But even sillier is the idea that climate change and understanding of it promotes this idea that humans are somehow apart from nature and that we shouldn't touch it. It's ridiculous. Humans are a part of nature. We are a denizen of the planet just as everything else is. We just have to be careful in how we interact with it because we're such massive ecosystem disruptors and we have the capacity to take it kind of to the next level. Other animals disrupt their ecosystems too, but there are just a lot of humans on the planet now and so our actions collectively do have consequences and we need to be careful in how we utilize the resources of our world and how we sort of interact with other ecosystems on it. People who study climate change are some of the most passionate nature lovers out there. They wouldn't dream of proposing that humans need to like lock themselves away in a pod and not interact with the world at large. Again, it's, it's about careful resource use in a way that's going to allow us as a species to live on this planet for as long as possible and in a way that's going to allow other species to live on this planet for as long as possible. It's about reaching a healthy balance. That other thing she says there though, is she kind of hints as if this is this is a move that's meant to hurt like the little guy, the little guy farmers, livestock owners, the, the humble ma and pop shop that comes to your farmer's market and sells things like wool and honey and locally sourced meat. Absolutely not. Climatologists are simply pointing out that large-scale global factory farming does have an impact on the amount of greenhouse gases that end up in the atmosphere and contribute to global climate change. That's all. And in doing so, at least if they would have read any of the, the paper, the literature that comes out of this, they're simply suggesting, hey, like, maybe eat a little bit less meat or consider eating chicken instead of beef, since chicken has a much smaller carbon footprint than beef does. There are very few people out there who are calling for the immediate end of all animal agriculture. I mean, personally, I think all lab-grown meat would be a great end goal for 100, 200 years down the line because it would drastically reduce our impact on the planet. And I think that would be a good thing. What if we accidentally made the planet better for no reason? What a travesty that would be and having uh, livestock as farming production um, because they believe that the methane that is produced from those livestock is causing global warming. Um, so there are some areas that are actually taxing farmers because of the methane that their livestock is producing. Mm -hmm. But that is a difference in, it's a worldview clash because we're, if you look to man's word um, that is elevating the planet above people who are made in the image of God and then also God's word tells us in Genesis 126 that we are called to have dominion over his creation, which includes the livestock. So from mm -hmm. a biblical worldview, we have the necessary means to go out to own livestock, to um, have meat that is not cultivated in a lab. I mean, to me, it sounds like what she's saying here is that she should be entitled to do whatever she wants with the animals on the planet and with the land on the planet because her interpretation of the Bible says that she can. And like, no, that's absurd because not everyone agrees with you, one, that the Bible is the word of God and two, that that interpretation is correct. So you're not right, you know, in general, and you're even not right consistently amongst Christians. So no, you aren't entitled to do what you want because you believe God has given you license to do that. You simply aren't. Your actions impact other people and other species as well. And so we can rest assured on the authority of God's word also that he will protect our earth too. And Genesis 8.22 says, sea time harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease as long as the earth remains. So we have the confidence from God's word that he is in charge of his creation. He's in control of it. So we can rest assured in that. So one, what an incredibly selfish and myopic view. I can do whatever I want because God will make sure that I won't take it too far past the point of no return. That's 
that's just disgusting to me personally. But it's also not narratively consistent because I feel like God is known in the Bible to let people make mistakes and reap the consequences of their actions. Why would this be any different? Not only that, but in Genesis 2.15, God does call humans to take care, tend, serve, and look after the earth, depending on the translation you use, which is interesting given she quoted um, a version of that. We don't need woolly meatballs. <laughs> uh, not necessarily. I don't know if I'd trust them at this point. A show of hands in the audience. Who would eat it? We got Ooh, a few I'm brave okay. souls in here. All men, interestingly enough, I think. <laughs> yeah, women be shopping. <laughs> it's interesting at the end of this company was talking about how they believe the best way to um, transition a few billion meat eaters away from eating conventional animal protein is to invent meat which has already been done yeah. <laughs> when God created animals. And then, of course, we were created vegetarian originally. Ah, yeah. uh, yes. This answers in Genesis Classic, where our <laughs> theropod dinosaurs are using their mouths, which are full of dozens of knives, to eat melons. Um, and after the flood, God gave mankind permission to eat meat. Yeah. Something else I just wanted to point out, too, in the title, they, they say prehistoric meatball, but God gives us written, a written record of history mm -hmm, from yeah. the very beginning. So we can trust his word from the very first verse in Genesis 1, 1, God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. So we need not um, be confused about some of the terminology that's used There's there with no the prehistoric. There's no such thing as prehistory. Yeah. 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 There's no such thing as prehistory. This has been a somewhat newer one, at least as far as since I've been following Answers in Genesis. Ken Ham has recently been pushing the idea that since God witnessed it all, there's no such thing as a time period before history. And again, they believe that, you know, the earth is 6,000 years old and God's been there for all of it, uh, dutifully taking notes. So um, obviously that's very silly. The earth has been around for like 4.5 billion years and the vast majority of that time humans have not been here at all. We emerged as a species 300,000 years ago and first started being historical around 10,000 years ago, maybe 12,000 years ago, especially when we're looking at things like Gebekli Tepe. And to support the notion as usual that the earth is in fact very ancient, radiometric dating is what gives us those ages and radiometric dating is the backbone on which the fossil fuel exploration industry uh, stands. It requires basin modeling, which utilizes radiometric dating in order to find fuel, uh, natural gas, things of that nature, and power the planet. So I really don't think that we have any support for the fact that the earth is very young. Um, and in fact, we have oodles and oodles of support. Every time you fill up your car, you support the notion that the earth is quite ancient indeed. So after that, they pretty much move on to another subject. So the reason that Christians need to be wary of <laughs> Be wary of the mammoth meatball is because it promotes the notion of climate change and it promotes lab grown meat, which is both of those are bad because humans should be able to do whatever they want with the planet. And secondarily, that includes uh, killing animals, even when an alternative is available. So that's awesome. I really love to see the, the clickbait title kind of coming to fruition, although it wasn't as outrageous as I would have liked it to be. It would have been funnier if they were like, this is necromancy, this is witchcraft, because you're bringing an extinct species back to life. If God wanted mammoths to be around, he would have saved them. They would still be around. But instead, you know, they, they went with a little bit more of a predictable, I guess not that predictable since I didn't see it coming. Again, I thought they were going to go with the stem cells thing. But anyways, I thought this was kind of a funny topic, um, a good way to remind everybody that Answers in Genesis is still around and kicking. And in fact, they get pretty decent views on their videos right now, due in part to very clickable thumbnails. I think that we should all be doing our due diligence and keeping up with the arguments that Answers in Genesis is using, even if they haven't changed ever. I've noticed that they're switching pretty heavily over to culture war stuff and kind of taking a step back from the creationism bits, although they're still kind of shoehorning in all of the buzzwords, as I said, just to remind people where they stand. And it's kind of nice of them to do that. It makes it very easy for us as uh, sort of detractors to young earth creationism to clock where and when people are pulling directly from the Answers in Genesis repository of information, if you will. So I hope you enjoyed this. And if you like what I do, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe as usual asking evidently works <laughs> and if you want to support me in other ways you can support me on my patreon or you can buy my stuff from redbubble as i've continued to say over the past several weeks i've got some fun projects coming up they're just taking a long time because i'm doing like three projects at one time so look forward to that and i will see you next time